Hey folks, welcome to our discussion of chapter 30. Uh, I will say in this chapter, we're going to answer two really important questions about the macroeconomic system. Um, these are going to be two of the most important questions that we address this whole class. So that's kind of a big deal. It's cool. They're very interesting questions, though. I think this is a more fun chapter. Um, and then at the end of the chapter, we're going to talk about the Fed's number one job, the most important job that the Fed faces in the long run. And I think that's a really interesting point and I look forward, I'm excited to talk about it. So let me go to screen share. I'll share my presentation, uh, chapter 30. So we have two questions. You see the questions in my notes. Uh, the first question, how does money growth, uh, how does growth in the money supply affect real GDP, unemployment, and other real variables in the long run? Um, you know, last time we talked about the money supply, we talked about how the Fed, you know, controls the money supply. We talked about uh, the money creation process, all that stuff. We just talked about it, though, from a mechanical perspective. But now in this chapter, we're talking about how it really affects the economy. So now we're getting into the real meat and potatoes. So anyway, question one, how does growth in the money supply affect real GDP and unemployment in the long run? So to answer this question, I point back to... Uh, one of the most important principles in macroeconomics that goes back a long time. Principles called the classical dichotomy. Classical dichotomy. You see on the screen there, it says very strongly, very firmly, changes in nominal variables do not affect real variables in the long run. So it's a dichotomy. So the dichotomy refers to the fact that we kind of have these two worlds. The first world, uh, is the world of nominal variables. Nominal variables are variables that are measured in terms of um, dollar terms, unadjusted dollar terms, dollar terms that are not affected, not adjusted for inflation. And nominal variables have no substance. Nominal variables have no substance. They're not fundamental to the economy in the long run. Uh, and on the other hand, we have real variables. Real variables are variables that are measured in actual economic units. Um, like for example, the unemployment rate. How many people are unemployed? What percentage of the labor force is unemployed? That's a real variable. That's a variable that has substance. That's a variable that has meaning in an absolute sense. I tell you the unemployment rate, that means something in an absolute sense. Uh, and, and real variables are also variables that are measured in adjusted dollar terms, dollar terms that have been adjusted for inflation that account for, that account for inflation. Anyway, the world of nominal variables, the world of real variables, the classical dichotomy says changes in nominal variables simply do not affect real variables in the long run. And that makes sense. That's fundamental. Whatever you do, don't forget that as we go through the course. We're going to talk about a lot of other detail-oriented stuff in the next few chapters, but you can't forget that principle of the classical dichotomy. Now, we, we also have the principle of monetary neutrality. Monetary neutrality is, it's, it, it, in, in a simple sense, it is the classical dichotomy, except it's the classical dichotomy with regards to money specifically the classical dichotomy with respect to money specifically. M money itself is a nominal variable. The money supply is a nominal variable. So changes in the money supply do not affect real variables in the long run. That's the, mon that's the principle of monetary neutrality specifically. So I want you to think about it like this. If you can, if you can just wrap your head around it, it's really straightforward and it's really intuitive. You know, you know how much we produce in the economy is determined by those fundamentals, right? How much we produce is determined by those fundamentals, how much capital we have, how much machinery, how, many, how much equipment, how many facilities, the quality of those, physical capital, human capital, the education, the training, the job, ready, the job preparedness of our workforce, technology, natural resources, or our access to natural resources, those fundamentals drive, those fundamentals determine how much we produce. And in some sense, those fundamentals determine, um, oh, I've lost my train of thought, I'm so sorry. Those fundamentals determine how much we produce, and those fundamentals in some sense determine kind of how many transactions occur in our economy. Now money, on the other hand, a nominal variable, money has no substance. 
But we've already talked about how money is just fiat, right? It has no intrinsic value. Money's only valuable because we accept its value. Money has no substance. Money is just simply used to facilitate those transactions. Just imagine this. Imagine if we went around and if we just kind of the, the classic picture that you should have in your head that we used to explain this. Suppose we just went around and we just dumped billions and billions or trillions of dollar bills outside of helicopters for people to just pick them up. If we just dumped all kinds of money in the economy, the thing is this, we can't produce more stuff. But how much we produce is based on our human capital, our physical capital, our natural resources, our technology, right? Our productivity, those economic fundamentals determine how much we produce. If you just put more dollar bills in the economy, we can't produce anymore. So the thing is, if you, you know, number of transactions is fixed based on fundamentals. More money cannot lead to more production in the long run in a fundamental sense. If you put more money in the system, it's just simply going to take more dollars for each transaction, but the number of transactions won't change in any fundamental way. Just think about it this way. Suppose we went to every dollar balance in the economy. Suppose we just went to every dollar bill, every bank account balance, and suppose we just added a zero. So a $1 bill becomes a $10 bill, and a 10 becomes a 100, and you know, if you have $1,000 in your bank account, well now all of a sudden you have 10,000. Suppose we multiplied every dollar figure in the economy by, by 10. That can't do anything, right? Just simply adding a zero can't make us produce any more, right? If we have the same workers, if we have the same physical capital, if we have the same technology, if we have the same natural resources, we, we can't produce more just because there's another zero floating around on every dollar figure in the economy. We can't produce more. All that will happen is it will take more dollars to conduct every transaction. Inflation will occur proportional to the increase in the money supply. Now, I hope that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. If not, let's talk about it some more whenever. But um, this is a fundamental principle you can't forget. Changes in the money supply, a nominal variable, cannot affect real variables. I think of it like this, and I think this analogy is in the book. I think I got this from the book, actually, although I've kind of forgotten. It's kind of like a football field. You know, just imagine yourself the coronavirus pandemic's over with, we're going back to football, we're going to, to Mountaineer Field in, in September to watch football. Well, the size of that field is, you know, it's 100 yards. We've determined that that's the optimal size for, for playing football, 100 yards. Suppose that just, this is a silly, silly example, but just suppose that God all of a sudden said, you know what, we're gonna redefine a yard to mean we're going to redefine a yard to be not 36 inches, but instead a yard is going to be 18 inches. Do you think we would actually change the size of Mountaineer Field? I mean, we've determined that that field is the optimal size for the game as we have designed the game. If a, if a yard was just all of a sudden redesigned to be 18 inches, redefined to be 18 inches, all we would do is we would go out on the field and we'd repaint the markings. The 50 yard line would become the 100. The 20 would become the 40 and so on. And the field would now all of a sudden be 200 yards. I know I'm not counting the end zones. Don't somebody come and tell me, oh, you're forgetting the end zones. I know that. The yard wouldn't be, a the field wouldn't be 100 yards anymore. Now it would just simply be 200 yards. There would be no real change. That's kind of the, that's kind of a, kind of a, I think it's actually a cool analogy to, to make the point that we're trying to make. The field represents our production and the transactions that we make. The lines, the, 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 the markings painted on the field are nominal variables. They don't really have substance. We could just double all those numbers and it would make no difference whatsoever. That's the principle of monetary neutrality. But the key implication is here, right? The key implication is here. The Fed right, through its conduct of monetary policy, right? We're not talking about regulation or lender of last resort. We're talking about the Fed and its role in monetary policy. With that, the Fed cannot directly affect real GDP or unemployment or any other real variable in the long run. 
the Fed just can't, can't, the Fed just can't simply come out and, and put more money in the system and expect real GDP to be permanently higher. Or it can't expect unemployment to be permanently lower. Nothing like that. It can't happen. The Fed cannot directly affect real GDP or unemployment in the long run. That's important. That's really, really important to remember. Now, there's two weasel words in there. Can you pause the video and pick out the two weasel words? The first weasel word is in the, ah, shoot. The first weasel word is in the long run, right? The Fed definitely can make a difference in the short run. And we're going to spend a lot of time here in the next few chapters talking about how that is and how that works, how the Fed can make a difference in the short run. So we're not talking about just over the course of a few months or over the course of six months or even over the course of the year. We're talking about the long run. Nothing, nothing in this chapter relates to the short run. This chapter is all about economic fundamentals in the long run. There's one more weasel word. Second weasel word is directly. The Fed can't directly affect those real variables in the long run. But there is an indirect effect that the, that the Fed can have. It's a more subtle effect, but it's an important effect nonetheless. Uh, we're going to come back at the end of this chapter and talk about the indirect effect that the Fed can have. And that's actually going to be very important for us in kind of understanding what the Fed's fundamental responsibility is in the long run. So cool. Second question. Second, let me, let me flip back in my notes and read it off. The second question is, how does growth in the money supply affect inflation in the long run? right? Not a real variable anymore. Inflation is also a nominal variable, right? The money supply is a nominal variable. Inflation is a nominal variable. How does growth in the money supply affect inflation in the long run? Now here, all I'm going to do is I'm going to give you this quote from Milton Friedman. Now, if y'all haven't heard of Milton Friedman, um, he was a really famous economist for a long time. He had a really, really important influence on economics, and he's He's one of the most important, most influential economists of the last hundred years. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize in economics in 1976, just FYI. Uh, and, and just another small tidbit for you. Um, Milton Friedman was a really good communicator. And there's a bunch of YouTube videos of Milton Friedman just talking about economic issues. And, and they're really interesting. And, and he's really well spoke, spoken and he's very good at explaining issues. So I would encourage you to just watch YouTube videos of Milton Friedman talking. Now this is gonna make you a nerd like me, but oh well, that's, that's tough. Uh, but watch YouTube videos of Milton Friedman and they're really interesting. Now he has kind of a libertarian political stance and you may not agree with his political stance and I'm not arguing in favor or against his political stance. I am being completely apolitical here. I'm just telling you, he's got some interesting stuff to say and whether you agree or not, I think you'll be better off for, for listening to some of the stuff that Friedman uh, talks about. Anyway, back to question two. Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Um, growth in the money supply has tremendous effect on inflation in the long run. Inflation is intimately related to growth in the money supply. Just over the long run, I'm gonna oversimplify a little bit. Again, we're just covering the principles. We're not going into the details. But over the long run, if growth in the money supply is 10%, you're gonna see that inflation is gonna be pretty close to that. Just in general, if you look over long run periods of time, if you look over 10 year windows, let's say, let's say 10 year windows. And if you look at 10 year windows for a bunch of different countries for a bunch of different years, and if you pair up the growth in the money supply over that period with the, growth of, with, with, with the rate of inflation over that period, you're gonna see a strong, uh, tight relationship. It's not perfect, but it's gonna be a tight relationship. Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. So growth in the money supply, question one, has no influence over real variables in the long run. Growth in the money supply has a heavy influence over inflation in the long run. Now that right there, even though it was only two slides, even though that was simple, it's not hard to understand, but it's important that you understand and it's important that you remember it and it's important that you keep that in, in your mind as your foundation, as your, as your bedrock, as we go through these remaining chapters where we're talking about the money supply and how changes in it affect real variables. But anyway, that right there was the first, that was the first part of this chapter. This is not a long chapter. This is not a hard chapter, but it's an important chapter.
Now, if you look in the middle part of the chapter, we have two topics. Uh, one is this idea of what we call the inflation tax. Another is what we call the Fisher effect. Um, they're both straightforward. I am, uh, I want to keep this video brief. I know that it's kind of tiring to listen to a long video. So I think you'll be fine just to read about these topics, but read about these two topics in the middle of the chapter. Let me know if you have questions we can discuss if need be, but I'm going to leave it to you because these topics are not uh, crucial. So now what I want to talk about is, is perhaps a weird question. So what is the problem with inflation anyway? It's kind of weird. Um, we always talk about inflation in the pejorative, right? Inflation, oh, it's a bad thing. You know, we talk about unemployment, that other big economic statistic, that other big economic issue, we always talk about that in the pejorative, but unemployment is obviously a bad thing, right? I mean, if you can't find a job, that's a bad thing. We don't need to really put too much thought into why unemployment's bad. But why is inflation a bad thing? Are we all sure that we know that? Right, we talk about inflation like it's a bad thing, but are we sure that, are we, do, do we, are we sure? First and foremost, we have this concept called the inflation fallacy. So the inflation fallacy, it's the idea that inflation is bad because it makes stuff more expensive. Just think about that. Inflation fallacy is the idea that inflation is bad because it makes stuff more expensive. I mean, it is true that stuff is more expensive in dollar terms, right? You just think about a Coca-Cola, right? I mean, I don't ever buy, you know, soda pop at the gas station or whatever, but I mean, if you go and buy a bottle of Coca-Cola at the gas station, it's like a dollar and 25 cents, maybe. Is that right? I mean, I'm just kind of stupid for not knowing that, but uh, let's just assume it's a dollar and 25 cents at the gas station. And if you went back, you know, 75 years, a Coca-Cola at the gas station would probably be something like five cents or 10 cents. So it takes a lot more dollars. It takes a lot more money in the nominal sense to buy a Coke. But is that a big deal? And the important thing to keep in mind is that, you know, you make a lot more money than you did back then. Um, back when Coca-Cola was five or 10 cents, people were probably making something like, 50 cents or a dollar per hour. If you go back to 1950 and look at average wages back then, they were far, far, far less than what they are now. I remember my grandpa talking about, oh, back when I worked in 1940, I made 35 cents an hour. And now, of course, you're making way, way, way more than that. You know, you know it's, not, it's not a big deal at all to make $15 an hour now. $15 an hour only translates to 30,000 a year, which isn't you know, for you as a graduate with an MBA, that's not a lot. I mean, you're going to make a lot more than $15 when you graduate. The issue isn't, you know, how many dollars does it take to buy a Coca-Cola? The real issue is, you know, how long do you have to work to buy a Coca-Cola? Does it take 15 minutes of work to buy a Coca-Cola? Does it take five minutes? Does it take an hour? That's the issue. And, and, and you have to remember that, you know, wages move with inflation not perfectly and not in the short run. You know, there are, you know, gaps in the short run and there is bumpiness in the economy in the short run, but in the long run, wages typically move with inflation. So, so the notion that inflation has made Coca-Cola more expensive, it's, it's not right. It's a fallacy. Inflation has driven up the price of Coca-Cola, but it's also driven up wages. And it's not even remotely true that, that that inflation has made Coke more expensive. If Coke used to take, you know, 30 minutes to buy a Coke, and now if it takes 20 minutes to buy a Coke with average wages in the economy, then, then Coke's cheaper now, even if Coke costs, uh, you know, more, more cents, more, you know, 50 cents versus a dollar versus whatever. Uh, and I would argue Coke is actually probably a lot cheaper now than it was 75 years ago, even though the dollar figure is more. You know, we talked about this back in the inflation chapter, right? We talked about how to adjust for dollar figures over time. We talked about what really matters is, is, is how much stuff you can buy with a dollar, how much stuff you can buy with an hour's worth of labor, I mean to say. How much stuff can you buy with an hour's worth of labor? That's what really matters. The inflation fallacy, 
the idea that inflation is bad because it makes stuff more expensive, it's not true. So there are some real costs associated with inflation. Again, also to keep this video brief, I'm not going to go through them because they're just laid out in the book. And these four factors that I have laid out here, they're understandable. They're not hard. So I would encourage you to just uh, read those four true costs of inflation. You'll find that they're all relatively simple. They're all relatively small things. I mean, menu costs, let, let's just say menu costs, for example, it's the cost of literally changing prices. It comes from the idea that if you, if you have a restaurant, and if we have inflation over time, every now and then you have to periodically change your prices. Like li literally, physically, you have to change your prices periodically. And there's some cost, there's some hassle, there's some headache associated with that. So that's a real cost of inflation. And the other three that I have listed there are all similar. They're all uh, real costs of inflation, but, but honestly, they're all pretty straightforward and pretty minor things. At the very least, when we're talking about inflation that's around two or three percent and if it's steady those costs are minor those costs can become important if inflation gets really high if we're talking about 10 or 15 percent inflation or if we're talking about hyperinflation where inflation is a hundred percent per year or something even more than that then then those costs can be a real big deal but at two or three percent inflation in, with two or three percent inflation those costs are pretty minor and they're not really causing a whole lot of harm in the economy. So here's something that might be surprising for you. Steady 2% inflation isn't a problem. It's not a problem. It's okay. It's, it's not a big deal to have steady 2% inflation in the economy. And a matter of fact, that's actually what we target. We want inflation to be, uh, we don't want inflation to be zero. We're gonna come back and talk about this a little bit more later on, but right now, take my word for it, we don't want inflation to be zero, we want it to be a steady 2% rate, and that's fine. Those menu costs, shoe leather costs, et cetera, are minor at that point, and, and this notion that 2% inflation is gonna make stuff more expensive, it's a fallacy. So here we go. What is the problem with inflation? Um, the issue here is we have a, we have a problem with, with volatile inflation. And you have to remember back in the inflation chapter, that, that homework problem that we worked on at the end of the inflation chapter. Remember when you know, you know, we have a borrower and a lender and there's an unexpected jump in inflation. Remember, the unexpected jump in inflation, I'm gonna take off screen. Remember the unexpected jump in inflation, remember what it did. It redistributed wealth away from the lender to the borrower. An unexpected jump in, in inflation, it, it ate away, it eats away at the value of those dollars that the borrower has to pay back to the lender. And it essentially makes the borrower better off, it makes the lender worse off. That arbitrary wealth redistribution that comes from volatile inflation, that is a problem. I'm going to screen share again, except now I'm going to go over here to my little notepad. So think about the model that we wrote uh, at the end of the savings and investment chapter. We were talking about the quantity We were talking about the quantity of savings and investment, and we were talking about the real interest rate over here on this axis. Again, sorry, my scribbling geez. Here's the demand for financial capital. There's the supply of financial capital. There's the quantity of savings and investment initially. Now, if we have volatile inflation, think about what happens if we have volatile inflation. And I'm not talking about just one little spell of volatile inflation. Here in this example, I'm talking about persistent volatility and in inflation that lasts over you know, a substantial period of time. So if inflation jumps unexpectedly, that hurts the borrower. If inflation falls unexpectedly, that hurts the lender. If inflation is volatile, it's gonna be moving around unexpectedly all the time. It's gonna be a common thing. This is the thing, volatile inflation, it creates risk. It just creates a, there's always risk in financial markets. Obviously we talked about that before. 
there's always risk in financial markets, but volatile inflation will enhance that risk. It'll create more risk. I mean, it'll create an additional source of risk, I mean to say. People who are saving, what are they going to think about that risk? I'll tell you, they're not going to like it. People are risk averse. Volatile inflation will reduce the supply of financial capital in the economy in the long run. If, if inflation is volatile, if that, if that risk is allowed to persist, it will make people less inclined to save. It will reduce the supply of financial capital. And the exact same is true on the investment side with businesses that are thinking about investing. Volatile inflation will reduce the demand for financial capital as well because of that extra risk. We started off here at point A. Both people, both sides of the market will be less inclined to act with volatile inflation. Thus, the decrease in both curves will end up at point B. It's ambiguous what happens with the interest rate, but that's not what we care about. We're not worried about the interest rate. What we care about is the quantity of savings and investment will fall. This is a big deal. Remember, this savings and investment, what we're talking about here, this is an important driver of productivity in the economy in the long run. I'm gonna take this off right now because we don't need that anymore. That investment, is, that's how we get physical capital. That's how we acquire physical capital. That's how we improve productivity in the economy in the long run. If inflation is allowed to be volatile in the long run, it creates more risk, it makes people less inclined to borrow. It makes people less inclined to lend. It hurts the economy in the long run. That's a big deal. That's a problem. I'm going to go back to screen share one more time. Sorry to be so schizophrenic here, for goodness sakes. That's the wrong chapter number. Sorry about that. That's chapter 26, not, not chapter 8. Jeez. Here's the point. What should the Fed do in the long run? We know the Fed just can't simply come out and put more money in the system and think that that's going to improve unemployment or real GDP in the long run. Right? Short run's a different story. You can't just put more money in the system and think that's going to uh, help matters in the long run. What the Fed can do in the long run is it can make sure inflation's not volatile. Right? The Fed has a lot of control over inflation. Not perfect control, but the Fed has a lot of control over inflation. And the Fed does have it in its ability to make sure that inflation isn't volatile. The Fed can make sure that inflation is steady over the long run. Not perfectly steady, but the Fed can do a pretty good job at making sure that inflation is, is pretty steady. So look at this quote. This is from Alan Greenspan, who was the Fed chair from 87 through 06. Alan Greenspan was a Fed chair like when I was in college, for example. So I used to kind of hear a lot about Alan Greenspan when I was coming of age. Uh, and I've seen him before. I've actually seen him speak live. So that's, you know, kind of cool. He's a celebrity among economists, right? I mean, we're not, you know, I mean, we don't follow, you know, Taylor Swift or whoever your favorite celebrity is. We follow Alan Greenspan. Yeah, go ahead. Go laugh at me for using Taylor Swift as my example of a celebrity. I don't know who young people look to as celebrities anymore. I'm getting old. So feel free to tell your friend, oh, Professor Deskins is so out of touch. He uses Taylor Swift as his example. Anyway, Alan Greenspan is a celebrity for economists. Uh, this is a quote from him. Maximum sustainable economic growth over time is the, is the Fed's ultimate objective. That part's straightforward. That's not what I'm really focusing on here. Maximum sustainable economic growth over time is the Fed's ultimate objective. The primary role of monetary policy in the pursuit of this goal is to foster price stability. Price stability actually doesn't mean that prices are stable. It actually means that inflation is stable. It's kind of a little bit of a mix on words, but that's what it means. The primary role of monetary policy in the pursuit of this goal is to foster price stability. The Fed's number one job in the long run is to make sure that inflation is smooth and stable. If it does that, it will prevent this, this extra risk, this unnecessary risk from existing in financial markets. It will allow for savings and investment to be healthy, and that'll be a good thing. And that's what we want in the long run. So remember, if, if you ever get quizzed, uh, you know, like in life, remember the Fed's number one job is to make sure that we have price stability in the long run. 
that's an important lesson. We'll talk about that more as we go through the course. So this has been a short lecture. Uh, this chapter is not a long chapter. It's not a complicated chapter, but it's a really important chapter. And I think it's an interesting chapter. So uh, be, be more than happy to chat more about it in our Zoom discussion. So uh, that's it. Talk to you soon.